All right, guys, we're going to, we have a special treat for you today. We're so happy to have you on the webinar training today. Um, we're going to be going over how to architect the perfect nonprofit so that you always get grants. Uh, we have Kyleen Walker uh, here. She is the co-founder of Wise Steward Ministries, and in her organization, she wrote the grants, and she received over $175,000 per year in grants, and this was a startup nonprofit organization. Um, she has since then helped many nonprofits start, and she has, she's been assisting with grant writing and grant assistance and helping um, clients get their 501c3s put through without any delay with the IRS. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Kylene Walker. <laughs> uh, Kylene, I, I just want to talk about Y Steward Ministries for a moment. And I, I want to, I want you to let us know what what Y Steward Ministries was and can you tell me your passion? Why did you open Y Steward Ministries? Uh, thanks, Tina, um, and welcome to everybody on the webinar today. Um, in answer to your question, I'll start by telling you what my passion is. Uh, my passion is people, and my passion is serving people, especially young people. Um, so back in 1999, um, my husband and I started Wise Stewart Ministries to improve the financial literacy of young people in the city of Detroit. Uh, what we found is that they were typically not afforded the opportunities to get that type of education, which is typical in most urban areas and in the inner city. So um, my husband having a, a finance degree, a master's in business and finance, and being a stockbroker and me assisting him in his for-profit business as a stockbroker, uh, we saw a tremendous need uh, to educate young people, especially African-American young people, about Wall Street mm. and how they can participate in a society of capitalism as owners and not just consumers. So um, in, that, in that area, in 1999, in the Detroit area, we founded Wise Steward Ministries and started with a pilot program uh, with a middle school teaching the fifth grade math class. And it was so successful that the students would go home to their parents and the parents will call the principal and say, hey, why are my kids, you know, looking at ticker tapes on CNN? Mm -hmm. And they're talking to us about stocks, and we don't know anything about it ourselves, so do you have a program for the parents? Wow. You know, so um, the pilot program was wildly successful. Um, from that point, we partnered with other schools in the area uh, based on the recommendation of that principal, and we began to run an after-school program. Um, teaching young people about Wall Street, and we did the after-school program successfully for about a year and a half. And it was at that point that we realized that we had to change our model. So what we did is we wanted to bring the parents into the educational process, so we formed what we called Young Investor Learning Teams around the city in partnership with churches and other nonprofit organizations uh, and schools. And we would offer the program, um, which was like a six-week training program, at night, you know, after, after work hours and on weekends and even some Sunday evenings, depending on the region. And this way, we were able to bring the parent into the classroom, sit them in the back of the classroom, teach the children at the fifth grade level a very complex subject. So now the parent and the child are learning together. Wow. So we evaluated our programs, we measured our outcomes, and we determined that it was more effective to partner the parent and the child together um, in this educational process. So the outcomes from that, from changing the model and, and, and taking the program in that direction, the outcomes was that we had parents who now became first-time investors. Some of them had never participated in their 401k and had been at different companies for 20 and 30 years. Wow. And now they understood the necessity of, 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 of investing in their own future, in the future of their children. Uh, we partnered with a company out of New York um, to offer dividend reinvestment plans so that children can buy stock without paying commission fees. So they were buying their first, first stock. Um, and that, that outcome was so powerful, the funding began to, to, to roll in. Wow. Wow. 
you know, a lot of times people don't realize, you know, you have a passion and there's money out there to to fund your passion and you can really help people. Um, and you just did, you asked, you, you answered my next question, which was what services did you provide for the community? Um, and so you did, you helped those kids learn how to, to read ticker tapes. I mean, that's something that's foreign. It is, and you know, in, in, in providing those types of services, we provided classroom setting services and we also held the city's first Youth Money and Wall Street conference. Wow. So once a year, uh, we would sell this conference out with, you know, over 300 participants, and, and this would include parents and children, and we would bring in business owners, um, such as um, CFOs from major corporations to present investor relations presentations to this, to this body of people. Uh, we also had parent volunteers to help with this conference. And at the conference, what we did was we marketed the, the learning teams from around the city so that people could enroll in that, in those uh, long-term um, educational programs. Um, so in providing the services, not only did we hold conferences, we also held the educational workshops. We took them on tours to Wall Street. I mean, all of this was done with grant funding. Awesome, awesome. Can you tell us about that tour that you went on? Or? Sure, sure. We took two bus loads to the city of New York to tour the financial district and to tour Bloomberg. So Bloomberg uh, welcomed the, the, the young folks into their, their corporation and they gave them a tour and treated them as potential investors. So that entire trip was funded by grants and contributions. Uh, contributions from corporations and grants from foundations. It was a wildly successful tour. The kids loved it. The parents that went along, they loved it. And the kids were really impacted by that experience. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is uh, truly a treat. I I'm going to keep, keep it moving here. Uh, can you tell us why nonprofits exist? Because a lot of times people don't understand that, um, you know, Nonprofits get money and they they're funded and we have to we have to uh, we have to pay our people and everything like that and so we just want to know why nonprofits exist and why do people donate money why do why do people give money and why are there grants available well um it's interesting because I came across a grant announcement uh, this week from the federal government. Um, the announcement came out on February 24th and it's for the Social Innovation Fund. They are awarding $10 million to some intermediary organizations. And an intermediary organization would be a foundation, for instance. They are awarding monies to intermediary organizations to fund youth development, economic opportunity, and healthy futures. So what they have found is they, the, commu the community, if you're in a community, that individual in the community is best able to meet the needs of their own community. And so historically, nonprofits have existed because the government understands that they need community-based organizations to meet the needs of the community. The government cannot do it all. Mm -hmm. So to incentivize uh, this structure or this entity, they make the entity tax exempt. So that individuals that donate or give contributions to the tax exempt organization can get the tax write-off. So it's a win-win. So now you have a community that's able to benefit from the nonprofit organization, and I'm speaking of the 501c3 structure. There are several different types of nonprofits. Today we're talking about the 501c3. Um, so the, the 501c3 is able to do its work in the community, and the individual that's contributing is able to get the tax write-off. So I'm going to read to you one of the core, the core themes or principles of the Social Innovation Fund grant that's coming out. It says, many of the most compelling solutions to persistent social problems in low-income communities are being developed in those communities and not in federal offices in Washington, D.C. Wow. And that's a very powerful statement. They have come to understand that to really solve some of the social ills and problems that exist today, they need individuals who are on the ground at the grassroots level who understand their community and that can develop programs around that problem to meet that need. Wow, and this is a new grant opportunity that just came out, and, and, and many of the people that are on the line today are, of course, in the community and want to help people in their community and don't know how to start and where to get some money to, to help the people in their community. Um, 
And so that's that's a, that's great. And, and what we did too before this course, some of the people that signed up early, we, we sent them out some grant leads. And so they understand that there's money out there for, for nonprofits. It's just we need to, to get out there and, and help people. Um, can you tell us, and I think you hit on this, why a for-profit organization that's running as a for-profit may want us to start a nonprofit. Um, I found that many for-profit organizations or corporations in the course of business, they find that there are many needs in the communities in which they operate. And what they'll do to help meet that need is they'll spin off a nonprofit organization and engage their employee population, maybe in volunteerism, um, something to help them to meet the needs in the communities in which they exist. Uh, there is a benefit because their for-profit entity could take some of its income to help fund the programs and services of the nonprofit entity and make it the tax write-off as, uh, as a corporation. Um, so there's a win-win that takes place there as well where they're able to meet a community need and get the tax write-off at the same time. A lot, of, a lot of large corporations like hedge funds and private equity companies and large corporations, they will sometimes spin off a nonprofit organization because they don't want to just make profit. They don't want to just be in the community to make, this, make a large sum of money. They really do want to help the community. And because what they're looking at is their future employee base or future leaders in their organization. So there is, there is a benefit. Okay. Okay, well, we're going to move on to the, to the next slide. We do have um, um, uh, some more questions here. We want to know about architecting the nonprofit. What makes a nonprofit organization fundable and um, be able to continue to get grant funding? You know, what, what, what do we do so that we can get that done? Uh, there are several... Um, elements to architecting um, a nonprofit organization that's effective. And like we talk about in our class, you know, I like to always start with the market research. Um, if you have community data that ties to your mission, um, that's, that's the most preferred way to start a nonprofit, meaning that, yes, you know a need exists in your community, but can you quantify that need? Have you done the research to understand the demographics? Do you understand uh, the numbers behind the need that exists in that particular community? And then you tie your mission to, to meet the critical needs that exist. So now you have an organization that exists to meet the need that you've identified in your, your community uh, or in whatever area that you're, that you're working in. So the market research is very critical to starting a nonprofit that will be effective and will have a long-term impact. Um, the next thing would be the program design. So now that you understand what the need is, and like we talked about in our class, uh, program planning and the program design is critical because, you know, you can have, like we started our program with teaching young people in the school system and we realized that it needed to be tweaked, that there was a better way to do it that was more effective, that would produce a more powerful outcome. So the program design and how you plan that program um, is extremely important. Most people think that you can write a grant before you develop the program, and it's just the opposite. You have to develop all of the elements of the program, and then you write a grant, because everything that's in that grant will exist in that program plan. So that's, that's the second thing. Uh, the third thing will be talent. And when I say talent, I mean people who are qualified to run the program. You as the individual starting the nonprofit organization, you are most likely very passionate about the need that exists. And you most likely have some training um, in, in administering a program or leading an organization. Um, continuing to get ongoing training um, as the leader of your organization um, is critical to the success of your organization. Hiring qualified individuals and engaging a very acting, active board of directors. The board of directors is extremely critical. Uh, the other thing would be a fund development plan, meaning that you take a business development approach to your funding. You don't just hold fundraisers, but you look for income earning opportunities to fund your organization and keep your organization sustained from one year to the next. You have a 10-year plan. You have a five-year plan. You may even want to make it generational. Mm -hmm. So absolutely having a fund development plan is important 
having sound financial practices, and then building partnerships with other organizations in your community and understanding who your local politicians are and, and partnering with, with individuals that are leaders in the system, in the, the school systems or whatever, whatever area you're serving, all very critical to architecting the perfect nonprofit. Um, as far as getting grants continually, having a strong, well-written well proposal is important, but tracking your results to demonstrate effectiveness mm -hmm. is extremely important. You have to demonstrate that there are outcomes. You change somebody's life. Organizations will fund you for many years if they see that you are making a change in the lives of those that you're serving. You will not get repeat funding if you can't demonstrate that you've made an impact. You will not get repeat funding if you don't report to that grantor how you spent the money the way you said you were going to spend it. So reporting requirements. So to get grants continually and to, to be successful in, in winning a large array of, of funding, um, tracking your results, evaluating your program, producing the outcomes, being able to communicate those outcomes to the, to the grantors and to your community leaders, that's the perfect way to get grants at all times. Okay, since you're on that subject, and I know <laughs> you've got repeated grants in, yes. your, in your organization yes. yearly, yes. what did you do? How, how you know, what, what happened at the end of the year? And then, and then they said, okay, we're going to give you well, $175,000 more dollars. <laughs> what, <laughs> what did you do every year? To, what did you report? What, what was it that you did? Um, first, you know, the first year of our pilot, we did get monies. We got close to $10,000 in the first summer to run our pilot program. Wow. And the way we got that ten grand from two different organizations was um, simply filling out their grant application to dot all the I's and cross all the T's. We gave them exactly what they wanted. We answered every question the way that it should be answered. Um, and then we reached out to the funders. Um, those grants were awarded for the 10000 for that summer to run the pilot. Um, and what we found is that when you develop a relationship with a funder, they tell you about other funding that's available in the community because they want to see you succeed. So they may have a cap on how much they're willing to fund as a mini grant, but they will put you in contact with other funders uh, that have, have funding available because they really are mission-oriented foundations and people that really want to see their communities rise. So um, from that point, we were able to go into three other organizations to get grant funding. Um, after a year of writing, writing grants, and um, I was involved in a capacity building training program with one of the funders that it was required to get their $5,000, I had to go to training, which was phenomenal. So I received training in logic modeling, which we talk about in our class, which is important for large federal grants. I received training in evaluation and how to track outcomes. I received training in board development um, and program planning. Um, from that point, I um, attended the Grantsmanship Center training, uh, which is a boot camp for a week-long um, training to learn how to write federal proposals. So once I left that training and together with all the other training that I got, um, I was a pretty strong grant writer. So um, what I did is I understood to, that to write the grant is one thing, but then to report to the funders how every dime was spent was also extremely important. Wow. So at the end of the end of the grant cycles, I had to report to each funder I spent five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars. Here are the receipts. Here's what it was spent on. Here's the program. Um, here are some pictures of the students. You know, we 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 went above and beyond to make sure reporting was um, was very well done. I know another question that um, nonprofit, well, people wanting to get into a nonprofit ask is, can, you know, you make a salary in a nonprofit? And because they feel like, okay, I, you know, I need to be for profit because then I, I need some money to eat. <laughs> right. But, I mean, if you have a passion and you're helping people, you should eat and you should still help the people too. So can can you earn a salary in a nonprofit? Um, absolutely. Uh, a nonprofit is just another type of business. You have to run a nonprofit just like any other business. Um, and with any business that you have, you have individuals who have to be paid a salary um, and fringe benefits. Um, or you may have independent contractors 
So absolutely, you can be paid a salary. The, the challenge is where is the salary going to come from? Okay. So the challenge is, have you approached your fund development as a business development plan, meaning that you're not only re relying on grants, but you may have some fee-for-service contracts. You may have individual donors who are given to your program. So there's an entire plan that you have to create to make sure that you have the income to pay your salary because you are worth something. You are definitely, your, your time is worth money. And if you don't have all of the funds to pay all of your salary, then the rest of your salary is considered in kind, a donation that you make to your organization, which is valuable to funders as well, to see that you are willing to make an investment. You have some skin in the game. Uh, but absolutely, you can make a salary. It's just like a normal business. You have to pay your people. Uh, but the challenge is making sure that you have the funding to do that. Awesome. Um, we're going to be uh, moving here. We want to know, and we you went over it a little bit. Okay. What? How are nonprofits funded? I know we got grants, mm -hmm. and there's there's a lot of different types of ways that you get funded in a nonprofit. Yes. It could be contributions, and I know you know that, so we're going to ask you the expert. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, some some typical ways uh, that nonprofits are funded, of course, is through grants, and the grants may come from. Um, they may be government grants. Typically, federal grants are distributed down to the states. And the states will, it will be able to, to re-grant the funds to local community-based organizations, maybe through the city. Uh, the announcement that I talked about earlier in the webinar is actually a federal grant, $10 million, that's going to intermediaries, which are foundations across the country. Those foundations will re-grant those dollars to local nonprofit organizations. So when people hear federal grants, they often think they can go right to the federal government to get the grant. And typically, it doesn't work that way. So you're going to get grants from foundations mostly as a startup organization. Um, contributions that can come from corporations. Sometimes corporations have foundations, and they will give corporate, foundation, corporate contributions, or they may give grants as well. Um, most, most times, you can look in your local area. And there are businesses that are wanting to see their communities thrive and do well, and they will give money to nonprofits that operate in their community. So um, you can definitely look for corporate contributions. Um, another way is through fundraisers, um, people that want to give to your organization through a fundraiser. Um, also, individual donations. It's very important for nonprofits to have an individual donor program where they're soliciting funds from people on an annual basis, a quarterly basis, or even monthly, giving them the option to give to your organization at that cycle. That's also very important. Um, so there, there are multiple ways to get grants. Um, sometimes you can go straight to the state. The state may issue a grant. Um, in our organization, we had a grant through the state of Michigan. Um, it was called the PASS grant. Uh, we also had um, a $75,000 grant through a neighborhood opportunity fund that was issued through the city of Detroit. That was HUD money that was given down from the government all the way down to the city uh, for the neighborhoods. And it was for rehab of housing as well as programming to help those communities start to thrive. So um, yes, I was able to participate in funding from many different levels, um, from federal, state, to local, even to corporate sponsorship. Okay, yeah. yeah. I, the, you are such a wealth of, of knowledge. Um, um, I, I want to talk about some some different ideas that, that some of our clients have had. Um, um, we had a, uh, a young man that had a landscaping company, mm -hmm. and um, he wanted to know if he could help people that were veterans amputees do their landscaping in the su in the summer because you know got to cut the grass and, and you might not be able to do it or you might be elderly and you you're on a fixed income um, or in the winter time you you can't get your snow removed because you're elderly like I was just watching a news uh, a news uh, cast where there was a 93 year old man snowed in and the city sent him a $1,500 ticket but he couldn't go out there and, and do the snow because he might die you know so we, we, we you know and he wanted to know is that something that he could open as a nonprofit 
Um, absolutely. Um, he's identified a very unique need that probably not many people are helping to fulfill right now. So um, he has, he's in a unique position to have identified a very critical need. Um, so absolutely, he could open up a nonprofit. Um, I would encourage him to expand his borders a bit, meaning that if he's going to open up and uh, start a nonprofit to meet this need, what he'll probably want to do is offer his services at a reduced rate. You know, so the nonprofit would, would do the landscaping, but he would charge maybe something that's below market value um, or nothing at all, depending on the kind of funding that he can get. Um, but he may even want to consider um, hiring some some young young adults into a, an apprenticeship program to teach them how to do the landscaping. Mm. I mean, I can see many possibilities for uh, his organization to receive grant funding to meet the needs, and not only meet the needs of those those individuals or for that population, but also cultivate and develop uh, someone to come along the next generation uh, to help to help that population. Awesome. Well, I know we have a bunch of people on the line here, and we know that we have some people that, that want to ask some questions. So we're going to actually, um, um, oh, let's see what time it is. Okay. Wow. Uh, we're actually going to um, pull, pull up and let, our, let ourselves go into question, and we want you guys to raise your hand if you have a question, and then we're going to take you off of mute so that you can ask your question to um, Kylene here. So tonight is about you guys and helping you guys get organized and getting into uh, a place where you can open up your nonprofit, and we would like to know if you're, you're, you had some questions. And also, you can type your questions in as well. All right, we're going to take we're going to take you guys off of mute. Barbara, are you there? Renee? Renee? Okay, Daniel. Daniel? Can you can you uh, hold on, Daniel? One second. We're going to take you off of mute. All right, Daniel, you're able to talk. Um, however, we can't hear you. So if your if your computer doesn't have a uh, a uh, microphone, you you need to dial into the conference line number, and we'll be able to. Um, uh, um, We'll be able to hear you. It says that you're you're on mute yourself. So if you can unmute your your phone, um, it says you're self muted. So go ahead, Daniel. All right. It looks like uh, we are muted again. Okay. Um, oh, I see your question. Daniel, you're not muted. So, all right, it looks like we do have some questions here. Let's, let's go here. All right, Renee has a question that she's typed in. She said, hello, this is Renee. Um, your only question is how, uh, how can you start receiving and applying for funds? Okay. Okay. Uh, the first the first uh, step will be to ensure that you have a 501c3 organization. Um, if you have a 501c3 organization, which means that you have been granted tax exempt status from the IRS, uh, you're able to start at any time uh, applying for for funding. Can Can you tell me when you got soon as, when you got your 501c3? Mm -hmm. You know, how long was it before you got your first grant? Uh, for us, because we initially started in the summer of, of 99, um, it was very quick. You know, we got our, our, our first grant came within weeks of getting our 501c3 organization status approved. 
So uh, it was very fast. And it was only because we were in that funding cycle, however, there was an actual uh, proposal out there um, when we got our 501c3. So what you'll find is that there are certain seasons. There's like grant writing seasons where a lot of foundations and funders will begin to post announcements about grants that are available and you have deadlines. So it sometimes will depend on the various funders. There are some funding, there is some funding that may be issued every quarter by some of the banks. Uh, but for us, it was pretty quick, but only because we were right at the beginning of a funding cycle. Awesome. We're still trying to get it, uh, get, um, we're still trying to get Daniel here. Daniel, if you want to just type your question in, it looks like you're, uh, we're not able to uh, hear you. But if you want to just type your question in, um, we want to basically answer your questions uh, here about starting and forming your your uh, your nonprofit organization. Um, as you guys know, with with us, most of you. Most of you on the line are our existing customers, um, or you've been in contact with us for a while, so you know what we do. But what we are getting ready to do is Kyleen has um, graciously partnered with us to do the grant writing course here at QT Business Solutions, and she um, basically will help you get your 501c3 going. So if you're in the process of, of uh, writing your form 1023 and you, you know, we, we've probably sent you um, that out and of course you know there's a lot of bells and whistles that you have to add with that form 1023. Um, actually we're going to actually do that for you if that's something that is of need that you that you need to have done so that you are absolutely um, a tax exempt organization. Um, the second thing that we are going to be doing um, as a part of uh, coming up in April 8th is Kyleen's going to be doing a six-week grant uh, writing and a nonprofit educational course. So basically, she's going to be helping you structure your nonprofit, helping you develop the uh, program development so that you can be in a situation where you are going to be getting, be able to get grants. As you can, as you heard her say, um, after she received her 501c3 status, she got a grant right away. So a lot of times people feel like, okay, I'm, I'm a nonprofit, you know, okay, I'm, I'm tax exempt. Okay, great. Now let's get some money going on. So you have to write those proposals. And a lot of times people are just giving their time and not realizing that people want you to continue doing it. And if you don't have any money to continue doing it, um, you're not going to continue doing it. So you do have to fund your nonprofit with some 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 uh, grant funds or, or some sort of funding. Uh, so she's going to be helping you put your programs together so that you can uh, get those those grant opportunities. Um, and then also, we, we have a database here that we use, and a lot of you that are on the line, we actually sent out some grant leads for your organization. And um, I see, hi, Angela, you, you are on here. Did you have a question? Okay, oh, you know what, we have some other um, questions here. Hold on. Let's let's look at this one. Okay, if you are rewarded a grant, are they automatically given each year if you remain compliant? Uh, it depends on the funder. So there are some there are some occasions where if you're big enough, you can receive multi-year funding, which means typically a three to five year grant. In that case, you're rewarded the grant every year. In other cases, normally you would have to reapply each year. Okay. Okay, I think we also have another one here. Uh, if I have a 501c3 license with the state of Michigan and I am an apprenticeship school and approved by the U.S. Department of Labor um, needs funds, have 40,000 square foot building and need help raising funds. So your your question would, is, is what can you do to get some money? That's, I think that's what your question is. Um, so he has a 501c3 already. 
Um, um, I guess my, my question is, he stated that he has a 501c3 license with the state of Michigan. Um, has he been recognized by the, the federal government, by the IRS, as a 501c3? Because you can have articles of incorporation with the state of Michigan as a nonprofit, but the next level would be to take that to the IRS uh, to get tax exempt status. So if he can answer that question. Okay. Um, okay, so this question was by Daniel, looks like. Um, Daniel, we want to know if you filed your for, um, form 1023 with the IRS. So if you have your 1023 filed with the IRS and you have a tax exempt status, um, of course the, the, the next thing is just uh, get the grant and write it. That's, that's, that's it. Just uh, If you don't have it though, don't don't be worried because uh, of course we will be if you're going to be in that course starting April eighth we'll write that ten twenty three for you. Um, um, all right, that yeah. Let's see, Daniel. Okay, so he said that was his name. Okay, uh, we we want you guys to ask questions. You guys are you know she you have a a, a person that has you know received hundreds of thousands of dollars in grants here. So you want to make sure that if you have any questions, make sure you ask them right now because she's here. Um, and another good thing is um, if you're going to be in the course starting the 8th, you're going to be able to ask unlimited uh, questions. Uh, one of the things when you have that, and it looks like Daniel already has a school. He's already, um, I believe I talked to him earlier. He's already had, um, had he's already had students. Okay. He teaches, I think, electrical plumbing mm -hmm. to youngsters. But okay. what he's been doing is doing it for free. Oh, out of his pocket. Oh, wow. And that's no, we can get some money for that. So Absolutely. can you tell us, you know, a little bit about? Helping him out, maybe? Um, absolutely. Um, um, if he has the tax exempt status from the IRS, then he can absolutely start looking at funding that's available in the area. Um, and because he's already working the program, he's already doing it, I do hope that he's keeping data, he's keeping information, he's keeping records of every student that comes into the program. Hopefully he's holding, um, they, they can test to show that they have acquired some skill level in the program. Mm -hmm. So he probably has a ton of data already to show to potential funders, and that will be very powerful information uh, to take to a potential funder um, in applying for their grant. So he could, he could get started with that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That. That's. It's. It's definitely going to be some money available for for him. Um, uh, if he has that tax exempt, I mean, it would be almost immediate to go and apply for those um, uh, grants for him. Okay. So we have uh, another question. Okay. My form ten twenty three has been filed. Okay. He needs to check to see uh, what the status is. Uh, the person is working on it, sitting on it, and I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yes, okay. That's, that's a very common problem right now. Um, the IRS is sitting on a lot of applications, and some people are taking up a, a little over a year to be approved. Um, if you recall, there was a scandal at the IRS um, last year where the IRS was targeting Tea Party nonprofit applications. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, they were 501c4 organizations, which are political organizations. They, they targeted those applications and held on to them, and there's been a lawsuit. Uh, what has happened is, is that um, there's been a huge turnover. They fired the, the director of the tax-exempt organization uh, department in the IRS and hired a few other people. They've streamlined the processes. So what has happened is that there is a huge backlog um, at the IRS. And um, in that backlog, they're taking any questions that they may have about your application. It's going into a pile and it's sitting there before they will even assign it to another examiner to look at the application and say, hey, here's the question. Once that application does get in front of an examiner, however, the process will go very quickly. They'll fax you, they'll email you, and you can fax some information about whatever your question is. So. Okay. That's... Uh um, we do have a question from Marva. It looks like Marva and Dana are asking the same question. When can we start signing up for the April 8th course? We have 25 seats available for that. Um, 
Um, and we uh, basically are starting to sell those now um, because we only have 25 seats available for that course. Um, and that's going to be starting April 8th, but you can, you can start signing up for that now. Let me, let me get to this question. I have 15 students paying now. Five thousand. Okay, so you get you probably get some no worker left behind. This is Daniel. He has. Um, okay, he. I have fifteen students paying now five thousand dollars per student with Michigan Works. You know, um, they they do have that. They I had another customer who was a hemodialysis technician training. Mm -hmm. facility and the state paid her five thousand dollars per student okay. to train them so yeah he's already he had some fees he already charged yeah. fees sure. he just hasn't received any grants so that's going to make it probably easier for him to get oh, grants absolutely. absolutely he's got he's built up credibility and it obviously has a a, a viable program that he's, he's working so all of that is great information for applying for additional funding Awesome. I'm trying to build a three-story story building and um, next to a prefet house that need funding. Who is this? This is Daniel. He's trying okay. to build a three-story building and an annex to prefet houses, and you need to raise funds for that. So the funding that you're looking for is not for the students. It's more for refab, re refurbishing houses, if I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly. So I guess my question to you would be, are you utilizing green technology in, 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 in refurbishing the houses? There, is, uh, there are people out, there are funders out there that are looking for people who are promoting green initiatives. And so what you're finding is in a lot of the housing development um, in the nonprofit community, uh, green technology is huge. And apprenticeship programs to teach other young people how to, to build or to refurbish homes, especially in neighborhoods that are... Um, that are um, impoverished, okay, low-income neighborhoods where there may be a lot of abandoned homes, and you're trying to raise the neighborhood. So I would look at um, some of the some of the neighborhoods that have been targeted, and um, in the neighborhoods that are being targeted, as as in the city of Detroit, I believe Daniel was in Detroit. There are certain specific neighborhoods that they're looking to to provide services for to bring that neighborhood up. So um, absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Uh, we have another question. I'm in the process of sending 850 to the IRS. If they do not approve of my application, do I lose the money? First off, let's address a new nonprofit probably should just not pay the 850. No, a new a new nonprofit. And if if you're just starting up as a nonprofit, you should never be paying the 850 dollar fee. You should only pay the 400. And I say that because. They're asking you to pay the 850 if you believe your organization is going to bring in uh, $10,000 a year or more. Well, as a startup nonprofit, you have no idea what you're going to bring in the first first couple years. They're just asking you to project an estimate. So what you do is in your 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 budget, and QT um, can help with this. In your budget, you keep it to the point where you only have to pay the 400. Uh, they're not going to come back after you to say, okay, well you actually brought in 25,000 next year, that that year. So you owe us some additional money. It's not going to be that way. You're just going to propose. You're proposing a budget. That's why they tell you in the application, if you're just starting out, propose three years out of a budget. Uh, so if you're in the process of sending $850 to the IRS, please don't do that. <laughs> okay. And if, they, and if there's not an approval process, people often think that their organization can be approved or not approved. The only way that your organization will not be approved by the IRS is if you're actually operating as a for-profit. So what they'll do is they'll keep working with the organization until they determine what entity that you should be a part of. Should you be a 501c3, a 501c4, a 501c6? Most people are 501c3, and they'll keep working with you to say, okay, we need to go back and do A, B, and C, and then we'll approve your 501c3. The only way that they will not approve you is if you're actually going to be a for-profit organization. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, a, a misconception that they can approve or disapprove your application. I, I think the only issue is you want them to hurry up and approve it. You don't want them to keep, uh, uh, you know, coming back with uh, 100 questions and then coming back with another 100 questions. And then we want to submit it and, and get your tax exempt because, remember, you're not going to get any grants until you're tax exempt. Well, I'd also like to mention, Tina, that I've done over 35 nonprofit organizations. I've submitted 
the 10, Form 1020 group for over 35 organizations. And my process, in which I'm working with QT on, is, is to the letter. And, and when I say that, uh, the examiners at the IRS have certain uh, guidelines that they follow when they review your 501c3 application. I understand those guidelines. We give them exactly what they're looking for, not too much information, but enough for them to go quickly through your nonprofit. So my applications don't come back with questions. So it makes the approval process a lot faster. If they have one small question about your application, it will get put into the pile that will sit there for almost a year before another examiner comes to look at it to say, okay, we need to reach out to you to get more information. So it's important to do it right the first time. It, it sure is. We, we, had a, a, we had another client um, that had, uh, um, they, they, their, their status was revoked because they didn't turn in their 990s in time, and, and Kylie was able to help them, uh, the IRS, with their reinstatement paper. The IRS came back with a, a hundred, you know, a hundred questions, and she answered them right up. And then I got an email on January fifteenth saying that they were getting re, uh, reinstated. So I know that you're you're an expert uh, at, at filling those uh, ten twenty threes out. Um, okay, so we have some more questions. Hold one moment. Uh, okay, I have my tax exempt status already to go. Um, what's the next? Is there a class? Is, it, is there a class just for grant writing? Well, it's it's all inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, everything is all inclusive. Uh, what we do here is we're we're gonna. If you already have your five hundred one c three, that's awesome because we can start working on your program development, and then you can actually be applying for your grants uh, as a part of the course. We're gonna write three grants for you, but we're going to be looking at hundreds of grants. I mean, I mean, we pulled for one client, it was 50 pages of back-to-back, -back, you know, grant leads. So, um, um, and we're going to go through those, comb through those, and pick the top three, and we're going to write those top three for you. So, um, that's going to be a part of the course. The, the big thing is developing your program. That's, that's the reason why you want to go to the course. And then also in the course, she's going to be teaching you how to write the grants. Um, and we, she gives you a grant template mm -hmm. uh, so that you can have, you know, your, your uh, common, what, common, what is grant it? Application. common grant application. A common grant application. A common grant application is used by a lot of foundations. It's kind of a universal uh, application that they'll use. Um, a lot of funders will have their own guidelines, but the common grant application is a lot of times accepted by many different foundations. Um, so what we'll do is make sure that you have a completed common grant application. And that's information that you can take and, and, and tailor to any other foundation that has different guidelines. So say XYZ organization has a different set of guidelines, you'll be able to pull information out of your common grant and do a copy and paste into uh, the new guidelines. So that common grant application is like a template, and it will be built around your particular program or whatever service you're providing. And, and once that common grant application is done, okay, so, like she said, some of those grants, you can actually just take the, the common, the one that we put together for you forever, and then just submit those to, to grantors that accept the common uh, grant template yes. format. Yes. So that that would be, and you know, the only ones that you would have to do differently are ones that don't accept that common uh, grant exactly. uh, form. Okay, let's get some more questions here. Hold on. Okay. Uh, DRAP program. Okay, you got to be more specific. We we wanna we wanna find out. Um, we we would have to do some research on that. Development. Uh, uh, it's development. We would have to do some research and find out uh, what what what's available for that. Um, of course, I think I, I don't know if I sent him out some grant leads. I don't I don't believe. I th I think I sent a few other people. Okay, she said um, that was her three year projection. Um, the three-year projection is, is is that's in your 1023 form. Hopefully, you said you made less than twenty-five thousand dollars, so that you only have to pay the oh, it's less than ten thousand dollars, so that you don't have to uh, pay that eight hundred and fifty dollars. You can get that cheaper. But if you haven't sent it out yet, we can do the uh, program. We can do the 1023 for you. That's not going to be an issue. 
okay, Tina, I am really going to have to speak to you, okay? <laughs> okay, in reference to your 1023 forms, she's confused and frustrated. Do not feel bad because we're going to do them for you. So throw them in the trash and we'll start them over. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll start those over. That, I, we we understand and believe me, Kylie's done it already. So why you know why why restart the whole process or why try to go through the process and uh, um and then you don't have to uh, do that. Okay. Wow, somebody had somebody pay eight fifty already. Oh no, can I come in to go over with a process? Uh, let me see who asked this question. Hold on one second. Let's see, who is this? Uh, I don't know. Oh, this is, okay. All right. Yes, you can. I'm going to call you uh, with, with the completion of forming your nonprofit. Yes, yes, most definitely, most definitely. Oh, I just see. <laughs> you just put that on there. Uh, okay, here's another question. Is a, it's a program that's by the government and the U.S. Department of Labor apprenticeship program. I need to find grants or sponsorship. Okay, that must be Daniel. That, yeah. Yes, uh, and, and absolutely. So what you want to do, Daniel, is start looking, depending on what you're teaching, I encourage people in the class to start looking at partnerships uh, with for-profit organizations and corporations to find sponsorships and then looking at local funding to find grants. So absolutely. To, I, I, to your question, there's there's opportunity there for you to get funding mm -hmm. and sponsorship. I'm going to find him some grant leads. I don't think I sent him over any before he got on the on the course. Okay. So we'll we'll send them over some as well. Um, okay, so let's go over what's in the course. Of course, it's going to be uh, three hours a week, six weeks. Okay, we got to hurry up. <laughs> uh, we're going to be going over structuring your nonprofit, doing your uh, board training cultivation of your, you know, putting everything together, um, um, topics like uh, best practices for your nonprofit, um, program evaluation. We'll be giving you some templates. A lot of, you know, a lot of these things will need, you will need to report back to the grantor. So you will be going over that in the course. Um, uh, we're going to go over board training, reviewing and holding your elections, uh, review of your bylaws. We're going to be giving you a template. Um, if you don't already have that, uh, your, your, your templates for your bylaws, your initial bylaws, and all that kind of things. Um, you'll, you'll have your, uh, 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 your initial conflict of interest. If you don't have that already, we'll be going over that. There's actually an attorney that comes in and goes over a lot of the stuff, too, and he is excellent. He's a nonprofit um, a specialist, so he'll be coming in and you'll be able to ask him all the legal questions. Um, we're going to be de designing and, and putting together your, your fund pipeline. Basically, we're just going to be pulling all of the grant leads specifically for your organization in your area. So we'll pull all of the uh, people that receive grants in your area for what you are doing right now. And then we're going to see if we can get some money from where who they got some money from. Um, you know, we, we're going to be designing that. Kylene's going to be working with you and putting together all of the uh, aspects of your program so that you get grants uh, continually. Um, unlimited fund lead. So we're going to be, if we got a million of them, you'll get a million of them. <laughs> you'll have the names, numbers, and, and the email address of the, of the grantors. We're going to take the top three, though, and we're going to write the top three for you. So, um, so you'll have them all. You'll have your grant template that you can go in after after you receive the um, grant course, but we're going to actually go and write the first three that that, uh, that we feel that you fit the criteria of. Um, and if you don't have your tax exempt status, we're going to go ahead and fill out your 1023 form, make sure it's correct, and then we're going to make sure that, you know, you're not getting any delays when you uh, do, when you do that. Um, turn that in. I'm actually going to go to a, uh, a uh, another site, a granting um, um, course or a grant writing company, and I want you to look at what they're charging just for uh, grant writing. So this is just for one. 
um, these are the prices. They charge at uh, Allied Grant Writing, 29.47, Stilliger.com, 3,300, GrantWriter.com, 7,000, Charity.net, 2,500, 29.47, uh, um, um, uh, you know, there. And so basically that is what the uh, is basically charging for their services. So what, you know, I want you to know what they are charging for one grant, and that's if you don't even have, that's if you already have your 501c3. What we're going to do is we're going to include everything in the course, everything, including three grants written for you and the 501c3 if you don't already have it for $37.50. We're going to be having this open. We have 25 seats left in the course, um, and you can actually sign up. Uh, if you sign up, you could put a little bit down, $500 down to start the course, and then we'll work with your budget. Whatever is in your budget, that's what we're going to work with as long as you can sign up for the $500. Um, and we're going to redo your your 501c3 paperwork if, you, if you've if you not already gotten that done. And if you've already got a 501c3, we're going to we're gonna work um, right away on your, your grant, on helping you develop your programs and so that you can get some grants. Um, we're going to be sending out, if you go to um, um, this link here, if you, I got it on the screen. Uh, you go to qtbizsolutions.leadpages.net, and you can, and it's uh, .net uh, forward slash get grants, and that's the link that you can sign up. Um, you know, then there's only 25 seats in that course to starting April 8th. Um, if you, you know, if you're already 501c3, we will work with you right away, though. You don't have to wait for the course. We'll start. Uh, doing some work on your grant, uh, finding your grant leads and everything before then. But if you can go go to that um, qtbizsolutions.leadpages.net forward slash get grants, sign up. We're, we're going to be able to help all of you guys get where you need to go in your um in your in your business, I'm going to try and I know you guys have your questions still questions there. Okay, <laughs> we got somebody signing up tonight. Um, yep, 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 okay, okay. And then what I'm going to do, I know Daniel had a lot of questions. I'm still going to send out those grant leads. But remember, guys, the next course after the April 8th is going to 4750 So, um, and you know, I mean, 3750 for three grants written, that's, that's unheard of. You're not going to see that ever. Um, so, so you want to do that, and remember, Kyleen has received over 100, she's written grants, she's received over $175,000 in her organization for a startup nonprofit organization. So you have an expert helping you get this done. Um, well, guys, I, I want to be mindful of your time. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can always email me. I'm going to uh, be getting off the line, but if you guys have any questions, please, I'm going to stay on for like maybe two more minutes. Oh, thank you. Thank you, too. <laughs> um, so that you guys, if you have any more questions for Kyleen now, we can go ahead and do that. Um, and oh, everybody that's already on here know you can email me and I'll respond to you. Everybody that knows me knows I'll <laughs> respond to email fairly quickly. So uh, if you go to Tina Williams at QTBizSolutions.com and you have any questions, you can you can email me and I'll get right back with you. Also, if you still want it, um, if you didn't get your grant leads for tonight and you want to get some grant leads, I know I need to send some to Daniel. But if 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 you are on this um this call right now, this webinar right now, and you don't have your grant leads, just send me an email. Tell me what industry you're in or what industry you're trying to get in. And I'm going to pull in our database the grants, some of the top grants that uh, people got last year um, for, for what you're trying to do. Remember, nonprofits, it's not that you don't get money. It's just that you have to 
get you have to form your organization it has to be formed correctly and you have to actually compete for the grants and that's how you get funded um, and that's how you pay all your employees and a nonprofit okay well it looks like we don't have any more questions I do appreciate you guys um, for coming on I'm trying to make sure I didn't miss anything here okay okay yes um, Thanks, guys. Oh, yep. Call us tomorrow. We're 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 here. We're here for you. Um, and uh, thank you again.